Hello everyone, today's video will close us out of the 1920s. We're gonna dive into the culture wars. I will leave a link in the description and in the cards for the online textbook, and those are the page numbers and key terms if you have a print version. And here are the guiding questions. I recommend that you pause if you use these to help out with your note taking. Let's first just provide a broad overview. What were the culture wars of the 1920s? So immigration to the United States peaked at the turn of the 20th century, and you're going to see a rise of nativist sentiment, particularly at the end of the progressive era and the end of World War I. And that will lead to a series of laws that restricted immigration. We also see a resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. It's going to expand in size and it's also going to have new targets. It's going to be anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant, anti-Jewish, etc. More on that in a minute. We won't dive deep into women in this video because we talked about women in the previous video. Do check that out if you haven't already. They do, however, just as a reminder, they received the right to vote in 1920 across the nation with the ratification of the 19th Amendment. But women still find themselves torn between the liberation of modern society and the, de and the demands of the home, right? So they're sort of trapped between those traditional definitions of femininity and a new modern concept of femininity. And we're going to dive a little bit into religious fundamentalism in this video, which also characterizes characterizes the 1920s, particularly in urban or rural America, that is, and that contributed to the movement to prohibit alcohol and advocate for faith-based education. Of course, we already touched upon prohibition, um, so this is by no means new in the 1920s. We just haven't discussed it yet. So first, let's talk a little bit about immigration and zero in on the Sacco and Vanzetti trials. So in 1920, Two Italian immigrants, Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti, were arrested for the murder of two men and for stealing about $15,000 from a shoe factory in Massachusetts. Sacco and Vanzetti were followers of an Italian anarchist group who believed in violent revolution. And they claimed to favor revolutionary change to help the poor and working class, and that included many immigrants. Anarchism at this time was a relatively popular philosophy, and the proponents hoped to make radical change that would eliminate the government, and they felt that the government oppressed the poor and cared only about the wealthy. Remember our discussions about the Gilded Age in the previous unit. The U.S. government considered Italian anarchists a major threat to the United States national security at this point. So that's just context. Sacco and Vanzetti were tried and they were convicted for these alleged crimes, although it was under slim evidence. The trial was dogged like I said, by inconclusive evidence, bias rulings from the judge, and just general anti-immigrant sentiment. The jury convicted them after only three hours of deliberation, and despite worldwide protests to exonerate them, Sacco and Vanzetti were sentenced to death. They were denied a retrial, and eventually they were uh, put to death via the electric chair. And many supporters of Sacco and Vanzetti viewed this trial as proof that the United States government had gone overboard with their nationalism. And their supporters decried the trial as evidence that the government had unfairly swayed public opinion against immigrants, particularly those with radical or alternative political views. As far as immigration policy is concerned, the United States sees a series of restrictive policies throughout the 1920s. So these policies are backed by old stock Anglo-American beliefs and racial inferiority, and they were also fueled by wartime patriotism. The eugenics movement was quite popular during this period, so if you understand a little bit about that, you might further understand what is driving such policies. The Immigration Restriction League provided intellectual and influential backing of nativist sentiment, and the Red Scare, also leads to more nativist sentiment. Uh, this also leads to specific laws that are trying to restrict immigration from Eastern Europe because of that fear that communism, socialism, everything that's resulting, of course, from the success of the Bolshevik Revolution, the United States is afraid that those ideas are going to cross the ocean and influence American values. And of course, the United States is very much thriving off of capitalism at least it is for the total country's economy. 
during this period, right? So that is an important thing to consider here. Legislation generally set quotas on annual immigration. So there's a series of acts, as I said, I just want to zero in on a few of them. So in 1921, Congress passed the Emergency Immigration Act and that set these quotas and it was called immigration again because of the Bolshevik Revolution and the subsequent civil wars that broke out in Russia, Russia afterward. And then in 1924, Congress passed a package of laws. They were nicknamed the Johnson-Reed Act, I believe, because that's the name of the bill's sponsors, but I'm not positive there. But in any event, the Johnson-Reed Immigration Acts lowered these quotas even further, and you can see what these look like in this diagram to the left. These ostensibly prioritized immigration from Western and Northern European countries, and it restricts immigration from Southern and Eastern European countries, and it virtually completely restricts immigration from Asian countries and African countries. I know that you see all these number 100s there, but in reality, this was sort of just a number that they put on paper. It was very, very difficult, if not impossible, for immigrants from countries that have the lowest number to be able to successfully immigrate into the United States. And it's worth, of course, reminding you that already uh, after the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, there were so many restrictions on not only Asian immigration into the United States, but also restriction of the civil liberties and civil rights of Asian Americans who should have been considered citizens according to the 14th Amendment. Uh, another thing that's very interesting about immigration in the 1920s is that starting with the 1920 census, Mexican was considered a separate race. And so essentially in the 1920s, these new immigration policies further refined definitions of citizenship around race, and they also further associate the concept of an illegal alien with a racial minority. And as far as religious fundamentalism is concerned, we see a parallel between religious fund fundamentalism and nativism. So fundamentalists generally rejected the tenets of modern science, particularly evolution. Fundamentalists were concerned about the modernization that was brought about by the progressive era in the 1920s. So things like sexual freedom, prohibition related crime, all these things were grave concerns for religious fundamentalists but they were not all embracing of other faiths. This was a very uniquely Protestant phenomenon. Religious fundamentalists were mostly evangelical Protestant Christians, right? They rejected Catholicism. In fact, fundamentalists claimed that American Catholics were more loyal to the Pope and therefore they were not loyal to the United States. So you can see that's a great example of that intertwining between nativism and religious fundamentalism. They also were not welcoming of the Jewish population, both Jewish American and also, of course, immigrants. And so that, again, helps us understand that restrictive legislation from Eastern Europe. And also, we should note that this time period, there's a rapid rise of anti-Semitism, both in Europe and in the United States. So that's very significant and there are also red scare implications there given that most jewish immigrants into the united states were coming from eastern europe uh, in the 1920s five states banned the teaching of evolution in public schools and that helps lay the foundation for the scopes trial which was also known as the monkey trial among some of its critics so this trial uh, we call it the scopes trial because it was about a 24-year-old science teacher named John Scopes, and he deliberately wanted to violate a Tennessee law that forbade the teaching of Darwin's theory of evolution in public schools. So the American Civil Liberties Union hired defense attorney Clarence Darrow, who was a very renowned, very skilled attorney. And in the uh, prosecution, William Jennings Bryan, we've heard of him before. He ran for president three times under the Democratic Party. And this trial essentially resulted in a media circus. 
and scope. Uh, so, you know, the United States was was tuning in again. I mentioned previously that radios are much more widely available, newspapers, etc. And so the United States has their eyes glued to this trial and scope or yes, yeah, scopes rather was was convicted. And it's interesting because, well, first off, he was only fined one hundred dollars. So it was sort of a symbolic guilty conviction. And ultimately, in the realm of public opinion, historians argue that Clarence Darrow won, the ACLU won. Ultimately, the world looked on and sort of laughed at this trial. And they saw the rural American values as backward. And this kind of shows you that ultimately what these culture wars of the 1920s are is this struggle between modernity and traditionalism. So in the 1920s, again, we also see a resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan. This was ultimately the most effective nativist organization that existed, and it was also by far the largest. Its head in the 1920s was a man named Hiram W. Evans. He transformed it into a mass movement by using modern promotional techniques. And the intended audience of this Ku Klux Klan, and I should say the intended victims, not audience, uh, was larger too. It wasn't just an anti-Black organization. It was also now anti-Catholic, anti-Jewish, anti-immigrant, anything that was not white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, right? And specifically fundamentalist, not just all forms of Protestantism. The KKK grew so much that in the 1920s, by about 1925 at its peak, it had over 3 million members and it was way more out in the open. You can see in this picture, this is a march on the Capitol. And notice in this picture that none of the marchers are wearing hoods, so they don't feel the need to have that sense of anonymity that the original Klan felt like they needed to have in the 1860s and 1870s. And one of the reasons why that is, is because many of the Klan members were actually members of law enforcement and even members of government. Uh, there were two major events in 1915, just to provide context that help us understand the Klan's resurgence. So first, there was the lynching of Leo Frank. He was a Jewish American man who was convicted of murder, but later his sentence was commuted um, and he ultimately was lynched in response. So this helps us understand, again, that the Klan is not just targeting Black Americans at this point, they are targeting anyone that they feel is un-American. And also in 1915, this silent film called The Birth of a Nation was released, and it romanticized the Reconstruction era Klan. It's very much intertwined with the Lost Cause movement, that sort of romanticization of the South um, after, after white supremacist governments return to the South, right, after Reconstruction ends. And it also, it was interesting in the sense that it kind of created this gendered, um, a gendered theme as well. Um, I'm not articulating this well. What, what I mean by that is that they, they tried to further this myth that the Klan was protecting women from the threat of crime, specifically from Black men. They're, Many, many black men who were lynched were falsely accused of raping white women as a pretense for their lynching. And the second Klan um, was not exclusive to the South. Klan chapters end up popping up all over the country, particularly in the Pacific Northwest. And again, I said that many Klan members belonged, uh, it, or not belonged, they were, they were participating rather in politics, and they're a very powerful force in the Democratic Party, particularly in the South and many Western and Midwestern states. Um, Portland, Oregon was actually one of uh, the largest Klan hubs of the West Coast in the 1920s. Another interesting change is that there is an increasing number of women in the Klan, but the Klan starts fading in 1925 because there were a number of scandals that took place and they reached the national news and it starts to discredit some of its major leaders. And 
It's interesting to think how all of this is still relevant today. Think about how this connects to the presence of white supremacists at the January 6, 2021 insurrection, for example, thinking about images of Confederate flags in the in the Capitol building and how I'm recording this video in March of 2022 and we're still seeing investigations and trials and uh, the American left is making the argument that uh, law enforcement is being far too light on their treatment of the people who staged this insurrection, right? So racial violence by no means uh, was limited to Klan activity, however. The 1921 Tulsa massacre, which we discussed in class, and I'll provide some resources below, it was an example of the U.S. government literally they, the government actively participating in the destruction of a vibrant black community in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was nicknamed Black Wall Street because this community was able to be independently successful without needing to work for the white community. They were building their own businesses, owning property, and ultimately it was really the fear of black success that triggered the violence that took place in Tulsa. And up until recently, this event was overlooked in history curricula. And really, it started to take center stage again in conversations about race and U.S. history in the wake of George Floyd's murder in the summer of 2020. So I think we'll leave it at that for now, just revisiting the guiding questions thinking about what a culture war is and examples that I just discussed about that. It's also worth just thinking of other examples of culture wars closer to the present day. We'll talk about them again for certain when we get into the 1980s and 1990s. And also we should compare and contrast the second Ku Klux Klan to the first one in the Reconstruction era. So in any event, that's it for today. And we'll continue with a new series of videos on the Great Depression in a little while. Thanks so much for watching. Take care.